And so I, I was in a, a very obedient child um, and uh, in, in this very unusual family. So here's what would happen in my family. We'd go to church, and I, like my brothers before me, was an altar boy. And we'd come home from church on Sunday, and uh, my father would then go into the pantry. We lived in just this old rundown farmhouse on 40 acres, just very rural. He'd go into the, the pantry, and he'd get from uh, a, a shelf a box of matzah that he kept there. And then he'd go to the fridge where he kept a jar of Manischewitz uh, gefilte fish, the thick jellied, right? And he'd fix himself this little after mass nosh every, um, <laughs> every Sunday. And uh, my, my father loved to sing. He actually had a, a lovely singing voice and his favorite song in the world to sing was My Yiddish Mama, which he would sing first in English and then he would go into the Yiddish. Now my parents, like, like many, many Jewish parents of their generation, like I'm sure many of your parents, or may, maybe you yourselves, when they had something they needed to talk about that they didn't want the kids to understand, of course they would speak to each other in Yiddish. Now, as a kid, my brothers and sisters and I, we spoke Pig Latin to each other for that purpose. And it didn't seem that strange to me that my parents or anyone's parents would have a kind of adult version of Pig Latin uh, that they spoke. In other words, all these little vestigial traits of who they had once been were to me, you know, look, I knew that my parents were odd, that much was uh, pretty evident, but I didn't know why. I, you know, I thought it was just because they came from Brooklyn, uh, you know, where a lot of odd people came from. I, I, I had no idea at that point that the way my parents were represented a past from which they had broken entirely, a past that was different religiously, obviously, but linguistically, you know, the food, for the most part, on and on and on and on. I didn't know about my parents' story at all. I knew very vaguely it wasn't quite a secret, and it wasn't quite taboo, but it was more of a footnote. They had become extremely devout Catholics. Uh, you know, I think most converts, whether it's religion or politics or, you know, a former smoker who used to be a heavy smoker, there's no one more devout about that which they are than someone who used to be the opposite. And so my parents really were just extraordinarily devout, and their Jewish past, they didn't really give it much weight. And so as a kid, I knew the word Jewish I knew my parents had once been something called Jewish, but I had no idea what it represented. To me, the most central um, idea of Judaism is tikkun olam. The notion that, it's interesting to me, it's a two-part notion. Tikkun olam, to heal the world, it connotes or it denotes that the world needs healing, which is in and of itself a concept that not all of humankind has embraced throughout history. But that is a central tenet of Judaism, that the world, from where we stand now, there's always something that you can do to help fix your small corner of the world or the world at large. But our point, our, my larger point is this, we're all eager to fix the world in some fashion. You all wouldn't be here tonight if you weren't. You're more motivated than the average person, right? We're all motivated to fix the world. My argument to you is this, however, before we rush off to fix the world, and assign our resources to the way we think the problem should be solved. My argument is take a step back, understand the problem a little bit differently, try to redefine the problem to figure out what's actually going on before you try to fix the world.